Thank you all for coming. I see 22 people are on the call as of now. Um, welcome to the Minnesota Astronomical Society's beginner group presentation for January. Uh, I'm Suresh Srinivasan. I coordinate this uh, this activity or this group for the club. I think I've been doing this about maybe seven years now. And uh, during the winter, we do monthly presentations such as this. In the past, we've done them face-to-face -face in library settings, but since COVID time, we've been doing Zoom calls and this has actually worked pretty well for us. Uh, so we continue to do that. Um, but once we get to say April or definitely by May, when the weather is better, we will head back to Metcalf Field, which is part of the Bellwood Conservancy on the east side of, of town, um, off of the Manning exit, off 94, people know where that is. And we'll do outdoor astronomy uh, where members will bring their telescopes and beginners will bring their equipment if they have some. And we will just do a star party. So people will, uh, some people will learn how to use their own equipment. Some people will be there to see things through other people's telescopes and just go from group from a uh, setup to setup and learn about different kinds of equipment, different kinds of telescopes, uh, et cetera. So we will start doing that again um, once it warms up. So today's presentation is by Steve Emmert, who is probably the biggest jack of all trades we have in the club. Steve does a little bit of everything for the for the MAS, and he's been doing this for, for a long time now. Uh, as, the things that I know that he does is he's the membership chair. So if anybody has any questions about membership or how to sign up for membership <laughs> or, or question, general questions around membership, Steve's your guy. Up until recently, Steve was uh, on the uh, committee for Cherry Grove Observatory, uh, the MAS's Southern Observatory site. He was on that committee for many, many years until, what, maybe five, four or five months ago, Steve? Mm, yeah, something like that. And then the other thing I know Steve does is the, he's the orientation chair for the club. So uh, if you're a new member or a prospective member and you want to learn about the benefits of being in the club or uh, you want to learn more about the different uh, things that we do, Steve's your guy. So with that, today Steve's going to talk about navigational aids uh, for uh, observing. So when you go out, uh, what kind of either star maps or or apps on your phone that you can use that would help enhance your experience. So with that, Steve, here you take it away. Sounds good. I will do that. Thank you. Thanks, Suresh. Um, yeah, um, you're just going to see. I just forgot what I was going to say, so I'll just go on to the presentation. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the navigational aids, you know, I've been a member for, of the club since I think 2021. So over the last, gosh, 22 years now, you know, that's one thing that's been amazing of the amount of technological change. You know, uh, our iPhones and, you know, other uh, smartphones and everything are so ubiquitous now that we just have, you know, it's second nature to pick up one of those things and do stuff. But, you know, when I look back in 2021, you know, PCs weren't quite as powerful uh, and we, and it wasn't quite as usual to, uh, to have them out on the field and we didn't have smartphones and, you know, we were doing a lot of paper. Well, I'm kind of a Luddite, so I do tend to use paper uh, a lot more, although I'm starting to use my, uh, my smartphone a little bit more in the field, but uh one thing, oh, I know what I was going to mention that uh, you said that I'm kind of a jack of all trades. The one thing I do not do is imaging, though. I'm a lazy astronomer. <laughs> so, oh, just of... wait, Steve. We'll change that. No, -uh, no, -uh. <laughs> I worked with technology my whole career <laughs> and and I just decided I'm lazy. So, hey, can, uh, I, can I just chime in real quick before you get started, Steve? I, one thing I did forget is if people have a question, uh, for Steve, uh, while he's presenting, instead of just asking the question, please click on the chat box at the bottom of your screen and type it in there. And then when Steve pauses or you know, changes slides, I will then chime in and ask the question for you. That way it doesn't mess with his rhythm and keeps the thing going, if that's okay. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, you bet. Okay, so anyway, I will deal with some of the technological things of PC programs and stuff, um, but I will talk about a lot about the paper aids and everything too, because there's a lot of uh, range of programs. So um, one thing I will do is I will pause a few times to ask what other people have and what they like, or if you've got more insight into some of the applications than I do, because as I said, I'm kind of a lazy per person, so I don't necessarily delve into the real depths of all of the programs. But the ones that I have sitting on this PC, uh, Carte du Ciel, if I pronounce that close to the French way, that's uh, basically French for sky charts. Um, that one's the oldest one that I have because it's, it's really a nice one back in the days of 
whatever, you know, 2001, 2002, 2003, it, it was a small enough program that it wasn't hog on resources and it could do a good job. Since then, I think the uh, probably the biggest one that's a freebie is Stellarium. Really nice graphical program. So we'll talk about each of those in a little bit more depth. In depth. Then I've also got Starry Night Pro, which uh, has a huge learning curve on it, uh, but it, it's probably one of the best programs out there. And then a couple of other little things like that. So let's delve into each one just a skosh. So Carts to CL. Um, it's very simple graphics. You know, it is actually color. If I recall, it may have been actually monochrome graphics on the screen when I started out. Uh, but, but it's basically, you know, mostly uh, single color graphics, just the lighter color for showing the Milky Way. But when you want to print out charts from it, which is what I did really early on, I, I print out, you know, you can customize the screen size and everything, just like all of the um, planetarium programs. Then you could zoom in or zoom out and change the you know, how how deep into the, uh, you know, how dim of stars you wanted to go or how bright of stars you wanted to go. You could really customize it very well. Uh, and it would, and it automatically creates a black print on white background. So it's not gonna use up a huge amount of ink. So it's a really nice program in that respect. Uh, really fast download. And it is available not only on Windows, which is what I run it on, but also Macintosh and on Linux systems as well. So good good little program still out there. I uh, actually just reloaded it recently. So uh, this is a screenshot from one of the most recent ones. Anybody, just out of curiosity, anybody else use uh, Card2CL on a regular basis here? Well, I can speak for myself. I've never actually used Card2CL, but I, I'm aware of it. Okay. Anyway, but... nobody's chiming on oh. the chat. So okay. Anyway, we'll go on to the next one. So just a little bit of information on that one. Uh, the next one, Stellarium. I bet you there's a lot of people that have used Stellarium because that one, another free download. This one has really nice graphics. Uh, the picture, the screenshot that I've got on the screen right now, shows not only the constellation lines but also the constellation graphics. Matter of fact, uh, Claire was using Stellarium last week or last month rather for her presentation, and uh, it does a great job. It's really cool that you can zoom in on stuff you can you know you can have the telrad field of view option um it's really a, a nice smooth interface i remember early on the first time i loaded it probably was with a dell whatever it was uh but and this is probably in 2005 2006 and it took them took enough graphics resources that it was really choppy on that machine but on modern machines it just it just flies and it's a really good option um what's nice about it too is it's intuitive um uh, and it also is non-intrusive so this is just a corner of a screenshot on the left hand side showing if you move your cursor, the mouse cursor to the left side, you'll have the configuration options. You know, you can set your location, you can set your time and date if uh, otherwise it just runs on the system time. You can change all of these sky viewing options. Uh, and of course you can search for stuff. So I pulled up a search for Jupiter, uh, you know, zoomed way in and you can change the, dis the representation. So this is a very, uh, a very, realistic looking representation of, of Jupiter and three of the moons uh, as they were just a few hours ago, actually. And, uh, you know, just a really great little program. Um, hmm. If you, if you, you know, go to the bottom side of it, so you can move your bounce down to the bottom side, there you can see there's the constellation and the sky view options. So you can turn on or off the cardinal directions on this on the screen. You can turn on or off uh, equatorial lines or Altaz lines. You can toggle constellation art, the labels and the lines on and off and everything. And it's just a really good realistic uh, program for free. Hmm. Um, the one that I'm kind of embarrassed to say uh, I do have, but I haven't really used it very much is Starry Night Pro. Um, we had a deal because Simulation Curriculum, the uh, company that sells it, is based here in the Twin Cities. We had a deal going on a few couple of years ago where you could buy it at a discount. So um, I don't remember which which price Starry Night Pro is, but uh, but anyway, I bought it, and it's got such it's so 
a huge amount of information in it and, and so programmable and so controllable. You can, you know, you can zoom through, you can pick some object, uh, some star in a different system, and you can, you know, hyperspace zoom to that star and orbit around that star and see what, what space looks like from, from that location. Um, it's, it's just all over the place. So there's so much you can do with it that I kind of go, wow, that's really cool. I'm going to go back to Stellarium because I know how to use it. So that was, this is one spot I'll pause and ask anybody here have Starry Night Pro and what do you like about it? On the chat, people have mentioned Sky Safari, Stellarium, but not uh, Starry Night. Okay. A anybody? Uh, Starry I have, Night? I have Starry Night Pro. Um, it's kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, it's it's kind of complicated. I I have it on my PC at home just to be able to do research, you know, if I wanted or needed to. But in practice, I don't use it very much. I I almost always use phone apps, just because they're easier. Is this Phil speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've got uh, I've got Starry Night uh, that came with my my Orion Dob, and uh, I use it I use it mainly because it it has. Uh, you know, it'll keep track of the 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 altitude of of things, and so I can I can I've got a little digital angle I put on my telescope, and I and that way I at least if I'm pointing in the right right direction, approximately using my telrad, I can I can really dial it in tight if I'm if I'm using their their where is where is this object in the sky because it has a constant you know it's constantly scrolling through those because I've got a manual uh, telescope. Okay. But it's a, little, it's a little glitchy. Okay, so you're saying though, if you zoom in on an object, it'll show the altitude and azimuth, uh, probably up on the top of the screen, or, or down in the lower left-hand corner where I see 150 by 87. It's uh, it's when when you click on that particular object, there's a where is it in the sky uh, uh, info uh, window that you can open up. Okay. Very cool. We got a couple okay. of comments about this. Michael Copper mentions. Uh, for Starry Night Pro, he, sometimes it's super versatile, and there's so many choices. It's it's a, it's too much. I think is what he's saying. That's kind of where I'm at with it too, Michael. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to see it. I've I've had it for a couple of years, and I you know play with it once in a while, but then I just default to the simpler, simpler, easier to use thing. Yeah, and then Joan Riley mentioned she also has Starry Night, but she hasn't used it because of. If it's content overload. <laughs> yep. She's not sure if she has pro or not. Yeah, but you can see on the right hand side, that's, you know, this was the screen I saw when I opened up and I didn't really go any farther. But you can see on the right hand side, it shows today's sky. It shows you can zoom in on, you know, what are the events that are happening right now? You can scroll way down in that scroll bar, you know, see what's happening in the solar system, what's up in the night sky that's that's available tonight. So it, it's got a huge number of options, but uh, but yeah, it does take a little bit of time to learn. And Yara also uses it, apparently. Okay. Okay, we'll go to you guys to, to get some tips on it sometime. <laughs> um, another one that I have, but again, it's one that I only have because I've got a Celestron scope, because I've got a C8 on an AVX mount, so it came with that. Uh, Celestron CPWI, which I've forgotten what it said, stood for. Um, control program with interface I don't know but anyway uh but that's actually um a halfway decent little uh little planetarium program as well and you can see from the options there you know show the sky show the solar system you can do the same thing as you can do on most of them toggle on and off NGC objects uh constellation lines and so on hmm. so Steve as I recall this is actually sky safari Steve uh, Celestron uh, was able to get their own version of it, but this is actually Sky Safari. It is, yeah. That's the one thing I've noticed, both in these and in the cell phone apps, that there's uh, Celestron made deals with, actually, with uh, simulation curriculum and, and ported some of their apps and used portions of their apps as their own. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of commonality in those things. So I don't have any others. Um, there are, okay, so somebody mentioned... Uh, Omar, you said that you use Skywalk too. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, exactly. I don't know anything about that. Uh, anybody else? Is that the Apple product? It is. It's uh, no. I do have. Um, I have an Android, and it's just very simple. I don't know more. I don't know better. I don't know anything else. So, I was just curious if it's a good one or not. I've heard a lot about Starwalk, 
Um, I can't, I don't, I'm not an Apple user, but I'm told that Apple has something like that. That's very, very popular. I don't know what, what it's called. If anybody knows. Yeah, I don't know what this. I don't know that what that one is. The the ones that I have for smartphone apps are the Celestron Sky Portal, which again, Sky Safari Six, it's based on. So it's based on simulation curriculum, uh, and I also have Star Walk, which I don't believe is the same thing as what you're saying. Uh, you said Skywalk too, and this one's Star Walk. So probably two different ones, but there's a lot of good ones in that same uh, in that same genre. Mm -hmm. But just to show the Celestron Sky Portal, you'll look at the bottom of this thing and look at the controls on the bottom. And you're going to see the same thing on uh, with, well, this is kind of a subset of what you'll see in Sky Safari. Um, but this one's, you know, again, comes along with Celestron scopes. It's got a good database in there. And what one thing that I like about this is, uh, you know, you click on an object and it brings up the information on the object. And then it also brings up, uh, you can bring up an audio description of the popular objects. So it's kind of the same sort of stuff. Uh, if anybody has has borrowed the, the club's um, uh, light switch, Mead light switch, that thing does audible discussions and some stuff on, or it can do some stuff on the screen of uh, what the object you're looking at. And this one does, you know, probably one better on that. Um, just looking at some of the controls on it. So you look at the bottom of the control under the search, you can search on all these things, you know, the sun, the planets, where they are, uh, current satellites. There's a lot of stuff on satellites in this application. Uh, all the various categories of stars, the double stars, the brightest stars, and so on, the best objects. Uh, Messier and Caldwell. One thing that's nice about these apps that, that I've noticed in general about star, uh, cell phone apps is, you know, they know where you're at in the world because they've got the internal GPS and they know what time it is. So they can not just display a big list of all of the objects, but they can actually say, okay, they'll highlight the ones that these are the ones that you can see right now. So you don't have to waste your time selecting something and finding out, oh, you know, it's below the horizon right now. Mm -hmm. Steve, uh, Joan Riley mentions that she uses the Skyview app. I don't know about that one. Okay. How does that one seem to look compared to uh, to these guys? Any any idea, Joan? Or very similar, probably. Hmm. Well, we'll hit, hit that Thank up a little bit. Okay. Anyway, um, so that was that Sky Portal. So the one that I tend to just, you know, if I just want to, pick my phone up, look at the sky and see, okay, what's up there? It's Starwalk. Uh, this is another one of those inexpensive ones. Uh, this one's available for iOS and Android. I've got the iOS version. Um, this one's uh, $5.99. I did purchase it and I've had it for a few years. And, uh, you know, it, it's the same sort of thing. If you're holding it down below the horizon, pointing toward below the horizon, it just starts out with a screen. You bring it up and it'll use the... Uh, the comp internal compass and the internal gyroscopes to to figure out where you're pointing and it'll follow the sky and it does a pretty decent job i've uh i'm not sure if it's my phone or if it's the app but you know quite often it can be 10 to 15 degrees off perhaps but it's still you know you can bring it in and and uh it does a pretty good representation and you can uh zoom in and and take a look at individual objects but it's just a good thing for going okay where am i looking at in the sky i've forgotten where i am Mm -hmm. um you can with all just like almost all of them you can turn on constellation drawings and constellation uh the the pictures and then there's the uh uh the the uh icons on the right hand side so the menu selections are are there so when i bring up that down in the lower right hand corner the uh that one that looks like a tablet uh, you know, you bring up those menu selections for purchasing Starwalk Plus or looking at changing the calendar beats and uh, all of that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. this is what there's, this is what you see on the four different corners of uh, of the screen. And uh, so you can take take a screenshot or upload a screenshot to the Internet with that upper left hand corner. You go into the search engine and you can search by objects, constellations, deep sky objects, and so on. This one also has a lot of things on satellites. So the main satellites launched in the last 30 days, the space stations, both the ISS and the and the uh, uh, Chinese one, uh, weather and earth resource satellites, geos 
geostationary and synchronous communication satellites and stuff like that. Wow. And you can, you know, you can do the same sort of things, you know, uh, put it into red night mode, uh, show the tell red target so you can zoom in on something and see what the, what the target should look like. So uh, really for a couple of buck, you know, five or so dollar uh, program, mm -hmm. it's really customizable and it's just nice. And again, I'm kind of a lazy cuss, so I like ones that are simple and easy to use. And just to prove how simple and everything, I'm too cheap to buy the uh, iPhone's uh, screen capture <laughs> app to uh, put it, you know, to do that. So unfortunately, these are all uh, holding up my phone and took a picture with another phone <laughs> and put, took took those and put them on the uh, the PC. Huh. Then the, the big gun one, Sky Safari Pro, uh, the current version is Sky Safari 7, and it's... Uh, available for Android, iOS. It started out on iOS only, and then it was eventually uh, ported to, to Androids as well. But the pro version is 50 bucks. The plus version is 19.99. And then there's a basic version, which is iOS only, because that was the originating, originating point of Sky Safari Pro uh, for only $5. But again, uh, Simulation Curriculum is the company that does this one. They've got, you know, just a huge number of options in here. You can see on the bottom of this uh, screen that menu items they do look very much like the Celestron app because again Celestron took probably the equivalent of the basic version and uh, and uh, added that but again you know I think the biggest the best thing about all of the cell phone apps is that they're in your pocket and you can uh, you can uh, you know select and search for an object you know, or you can point up in the sky and just zoom in and uh, and it's just easy to use the things. Hmm. So again, I was uh, taking pictures of a cell phone, so that's why this picture is blurry, but under the search, you can again see uh, kind of a sky tour of tonight's best items, the solar system objects, and then get down into the same categories, the best deep sky objects, Messier objects that are available, Caldwell objects, and so on. And you can, of course, search by NGC catalog or IC or ARP or the various catalogs directly because it had, I think, what was that on the previous slide, something like a 100,000 item database. Hmm. And then uh, just looking at some of the options, some of the uh, menu selections on the bottom, this is the selection menu. So you can take a look and uh, you can use this one for, and, and again, I haven't been doing this myself, but you can use this to uh, uh, download, you can, you can create a, a uh, uh, you can log your entries and stuff. So you can use the object info, get descriptions in a picture. Uh, of course, locate is to find the object in the sky. And again, kind of like the uh, the PC application, you can fly about where speed out to an object and, and you know, pretend you're flying around in it. But I think probably the best thing over this over Starwalk is that you can create an uh, observing list. You can add objects to the list. You can, I believe you can import lists from, uh, from other uh, from other lists so that you can do that, but you can basically walk through your observations and add to it. So it's a it's a good item for uh, really just in your pocket being able to uh, being able to to log your observations. Yeah, Steve. Another thing too about it is uh, you can control your telescope with it. That is true. I forgot about that. Yeah, you can do that both with this and you can do that with uh, what's the PC application? That was Stellarium. Um, uh, uh, well, well, yeah, I guess you can do it with Stellarium, but the but the commercial one. Um, uh, oh, just drew um, <laughs> a blank. Sky, uh, the second one you talked about. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. That Go back one. a couple of slides. Uh, so I can do that. We can walk back with the hay. Whoops, there. Uh, Star walk. Gee, no, I'm keep going. Keep going. Yep, keep going. I'm still on Starry Night. Starry though. Night, Starry Night. <laughs> they all sound the same after a while. <laughs> yeah, let me ask. Uh, this, so Sky Safari Pro is the one that I use 99% of the time because mm -hmm. it has so much in it. Uh, to, for the rest of the people that are on the call, is that similar? Do you guys mostly use Sky Safari or what do you use? Uh, 
Let's what are you Sky talking about, Sir? Okay, Sky Safari what, plus Sky seven. Sky Safari plus seven. Yeah. Uh, someone L uses the Sky. Phil uses Sky Safari Pro. Okay. Yeah, I like that feature Sky on Sky Safari, Sky Safari six and seven with the with the Pro and stuff. Yeah. To import the observation list direct, directly from the Astronomical League. So as you're working on their list, you can check off what you've done mm -hmm. according to them. Sometimes there might be a little bit of difference, just a few, but you can put there it put that in there and then you can do your observation nights and it'll record it as long as you're connected to the cloud. So you always have a record of what you saw for that particular night in that particular location. Excellent. Very cool. So, and that's on the various versions of Sky Safari, yeah, is yeah. it? Cool. I think I've had it on, on five, six, and seven. Okay. So yeah, that, and that's that's really that object list management I've got on the screen on the bottom of this part yep, right now. Yep, I love it. I absolutely love it. Hmm, so Don 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 mentioned something that's important too for Sky Safari is sometimes they, they come on sale, so you can get these for you know I've seen them for sale for fifty percent off when they do that. So if you don't want to pay full price, you just wait a little while. And they typically have sales a couple of times a year. And then John and Elaine mentioned they use Skyview Light. Okay. That's another one I haven't touched yet, but it's worth taking a look at. Yeah, the, on the Sky Safari, uh, the simulation curriculum products, again, because they're based here, they've presented at Astronomy Day and a couple of our events a couple of times. And that's usually when they've uh, given us the deals to, it's usually a short term deal. You know, they won't, they won't let it let me put it in member benefits and have it available all the time, but they'll do it for a couple of weeks and allow us to have a really good deal. Steve, uh, um, Peter Ruhlman asks, how good is Sky Safari at when printing off charts? I do not know the answer to that. I don't uh, know that one either. Because I, I, I've never used it as a desktop feature, so desktop app. So I don't, obviously you can't print off a phone, which is what 90% of the people will use it for, maybe a tablet or a phone. But I've never printed off charts. Has anybody printed off charts using Sky Safari? No. At most, I would do like a screenshot to do that. Mm -hmm. but I've never needed the actual chart since I've had the, had the whole database in my phone. Yeah. And then Don yeah. mentions that if you download the free Sky Safari, they will notify you when the sales are happening. Oh, very cool. That's, That's good, good Don. <laughs> yeah, when I've printed, wanted to print charts, generally I've gone back to cart to cl because that one, again, it was a low-impact program, and it by default does... Uh, black print on a white background so it doesn't use a ridiculous amount of ink uh, so you know that one was one of those things again I'm lazy I used the one that's good enough for me and just kind of stuck with that but I think I'm gonna have to start playing with the with these products the, the ones yeah. I actually paid money for I've I've used Stellarium which is free I have printed off uh, using Stellarium it's pretty good you have to do a little bit more work though because the default print on that one is a picture of the screen which you know it's dark background and light objects but you, right. you can go ahead and manipulate it but it takes a fair amount of manipulating to flip it around i think i've largely negative. got just black and white just printed out black and white seemed to work and so you've you've done a ton of ink when you printed it <laughs> <laughs> pretty much but yeah. yeah but you can turn like you said you could turn that off too yeah you can okay so anyway um hmm. so in in the settings menu on sky safari pro you can do the usual things uh these are just because it was so hard to read on this thing, I went through all of the settings and, you know, the normal thing, date and time, where you're at, the coordinates, whether you want to have uh, equatorial or elliptic, ecliptic, try that again, um, and so on. You can set the, you know, Epoch 2000, you can set refraction index, <laughs> you can do a huge amount of things. Um, and of course, you can change what the sky looks like, uh, what the Milky Way looks like and all of that. And of course, to the very bottom line, you can, as you mentioned, Suresh, you can control your computer, your your uh, uh, telescope with it. Hmm. And that is like, the, to me, that's the slickest part of the whole thing is being able to control your mount, point to different places, it'll do it automatically. And then it'll just start slewing again um, as normal. It's, it's really amazing. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to try that with mine instead of just using the hand pad. Um, so anyway, the, the under the observe uh, menu item, so you, here's where you can work with lists. Uh, you can uh, create, import, edit your observing list. 
Uh, so there's a, just, again, a lot of stuff. Uh, taking a look at the bottom one where it says equipment, you can add and configure your telescope. You can configure what's the field of view of your eyepieces, what's the field of view of your binoculars or finder scopes, uh, you know, work with your camera, uh, what's the field of view with a Barlow lens on, and, and so on. So a lot, <coughs> huge, bless you, a huge amount of, uh, of configurability on it. And thank goodness it has help too, which you can't read because I jiggled while I took the picture, but <laughs> but it's all there. Sorry, uh, sorry. L also mentions the sky. I think L means the sky X, TSX, has right. interfaces for all the common mounts, as, yeah. as, as does Nina, which is now becoming a very common uh, software, especially for imagers. Nina also does that, and that's free. Sky X, sky X is not free. It's um, most, de most definitely the sky is not free yeah that's what we use yeah well that's the one that uh is generally started out use with it's from software bisc and it's the same people that make the paramount mounts so mm -hmm. the big um uh, the big visual and the uh the visual mount and the imaging mount out at eagle lake uh you know are running the sky oh, yeah. and that's our default program for using controlling those scopes and yeah, yeah that does a fabulous job of that I think the, the license is $150, and then depending on the modules, it can go up a couple hundred dollars from there. I think easily, yeah. I think that's a pretty expensive program. And as uh, whoever's on L phone, L iPhone, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, can do Mead, Celestron, and astrophysics scopes because it has the ASCOM interfaces, so you can you can cover just about any scope out there. ASCOM and Indy, right? Yeah. Um, and another blurry picture, but they all do, um, uh, they, all of them have the, have the red mode. So you, so you can have the, the night mode. The one thing I did notice with Sky Safari Pro, it's not a problem with the program, but if I move from one screen, you know, I use the menu selections and I move from one screen to another, uh, for a second, it has that little white bar. That's the swipe up to, to minimize the app on an iPhone. And, but it, sh it disappears after a couple of seconds. So it's not that big of a deal. So anyway, that's what I had on the programs that I have. <laughs> Obviously, some of them I use and some of them I don't use. But again, you know, I started out way back uh, 20 years ago. And, you know, we didn't have the smartphones. We didn't didn't have as much uh, choice for the, for the uh, PC apps. So I did do a lot of things and still tend to use a lot of paper charts. Uh, so I'm a, kind of a Luddite there. Um, couple of things that are really good for starting out. So I don't know how many people on here are truly beginners versus people who have been around a long time, but the Messier charts, there's several of them out there that are available. And those things are really good for starting out. Also, there's a set of charts out there that's um, the Mag7 Star Atlas. I'll talk about that one a little bit more because that one's probably my favorite star atlas, uh, to tell you the truth, and it's free. So we'll talk about that one. I'll show some some. Uh, uh, scenes of those. One that I I have only printed off a couple of them. If you really get going and you want to use paper atlases and really want to get down into the deep objects, if you're, you know, you've got a 20, if you're using maybe the 25 or the 30 inch obsession up at, up at Long Lake Conservation Center, or if you've got a scope and similar capability, there's something called the Tri-Atlas Project. And that has charts that are down to magnitude 13. So it's a huge number of pages. I think it's on the order of 200 200 to 300 pages, if not more. Um, and it, fortunately, it is very well indexed. Uh, but that's also available. Uh, it's a free download. Just takes a while to download it with that many pages. But this is the URL for it, uh, if you have interest in that. I didn't pull any pictures of those. I have done it in the past. So I don't actually use that one. But it, I just wanted to mention that uh, Triatlas was a uh, free charts that was available out there. Um, so some of the Messier charts, I do have these things. I have kind of my default thing for, for looking at um, these. Uh, Astrotom.com is the source for these charts. It's 15 finder charts because you can see uh, there are a number of Messier objects depending on which part of the sky you're looking at. But they're nice because it shows a wide enough swath of the sky that you can see where you're at. And it has the tell red circles on it so you can just line it up on the sky and uh, do that. Now, one thing I like about paper charts like this is my default behavior is I I got a whole bunch of 
uh, plastic page protectors and I'll put these things in the page protector. And the nice thing about it, no matter which way the sky happens to be oriented, depending on the time of the year and the time of night, you can, you know, take it out of your three ring binder, hold it up to the sky and turn it the right rotation. So you can see, okay, this is where I'm looking and, uh, and where I'm going to find it. So these things, we do have them, uh, I also have them loaded on the uh, beginner special entry groups forum uh, under the announcements section. I've got, if anybody's noticed, way up toward the top, there's the announcements announcements section of the BSIG, and there's a topic web links for BSIG and for all MES members. And I've got a huge number of of uh, links there with a short description of them, and this is down in there. Uh, Part way, part way down, you can you can find it. But uh, I have a zip file of those charts in there as well as having a separate item of, uh, uh, of the link to get them from the original site. So that's one type of Messier chart. There's another Messier chart that I personally don't use, but it actually looks really nice. Uh, this one's called freestarcharts.com slash Messier. This one has uh, a full description like you can see, you know, they have a picture and a full description of the objects uh, on the web page, And then they have individual uh, charts, you know, so like Messier 42, uh, it shows Orion and you can see that that Messier chart, M35, you can see that chart. So they have basically uh, 110 charts in this in this one because they only have one Messier item per chart. But uh, but another good one that you know if you want to do the paper thing. Um, this is the one that I was mentioning that I really like. You know, this this may not be the best looking picture of it, but uh, eight and a half by eleven paper. Um, this one is 20 charts in total, but it covers the whole sky. The Mag 7 Star Atlas is on cloudynights.com. So if you haven't been to cloudynights.com, it's a good review site and it's got a great discussion forum with a lot of information in it. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, and everyone, and they have articles. One of them a few years back was the Mag 7 uh, Star Atlas. And what I like about this is it's a fairly wide swath of the sky. Um, so you can see on this one that that it's showing uh, Orion in the middle um, and Monoceros. Okay, Trina, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> I'm horrible. Monoceros. 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 I was yeah. right the first time. I was thinking it must be it must be Mon Monoceros because I always say Monoceros. No, Monoceros. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, but you can see there's a number of constellations on the page. And again, I put these things. This is kind of usually my default sky atlas that I'm using outside because I put it in a three ring binder with all of them individually page protected and I can lift you know take them out hold them up to the sky the right orientation and, and find what I'm looking for. The only thing I find that's not fantastic about it is that um, you know it does have different shapes for the objects uh, for the most part but they're generally just either circles or uh, circles or ovals, depending on whether it's a galaxy or a, or a, uh, a different object. So you don't really know what the object is. So you have to have another resource of some sort uh, for looking at what the object is and what the, uh, you know, how, how bright it is with the magnitude of the, of the object. But otherwise, it's a, it's a really cool resource that I like and have just been using for a long time. Here you can see a little bit higher in the sky, Gemini on the left-hand side. Uh, uh, and uh, Ariga up here when seeing Capella in the 37, 38, 39. So anyway, uh, the one one caveat too that I've got written on the corner here, it is available in both a black and white and a color version. Um, don't do the color one. They made the color items red. Works really good under a red flashlight. So, oh well. <laughs> Oh, another another caveat too is if you've got a laser printer, it's better to print it on on a laser printer. Just a little bit better to print it on a laser printer than an inkjet because the laser printer has a, just a little bit better uh, resolution. So you know some of the some of the smaller print comes out uh, a little bit clearer. So anyway, so those are a couple of popular uh, freebie ones for purchased ones. Um, We've got things like Sky Atlas 2000, the Sky and Telescope Pocket Sky Atlas, and then a couple of books that uh, I'll talk about.
uh, that I personally have. And obviously there's a lot more than just those guys. So Sky Atlas 2000, this is one, as you can tell, let's look, the cover is pretty beat up. This is the uh, deluxe laminated version. <laughs> and I've, I've had this thing since like 19, or no, excuse me, about 2002, maybe. Um, I actually bought it when the telescope shop in Egan closed out, which I think they closed out in 2002 or 2003. So I've had it that long. Um, this thing is huge. Uh, it's 21 inches wide by 16 inches tall. Um, and so, you know, before we had all of the other, other paper charts, this thing was really good. Um, you can get it, that deluxe laminated one, uh, or also a desk laminated, which uh, a little bit smaller, or unbound printed on heavy paper and it's non-laminated. So if you did something like that, uh, you probably want to do some, uh, you know, get some coroplast, some corrugated plastic at Home Depot or Amazon or something like that, and use some Gorilla Tape to make a, and make a, uh, a, a tent to cover, protect yourself from dew. So that's one thing you can also do. Or you can do like Trina also, because I think, didn't you put uh, LED fairy lights inside your, your little... Uh, in my little uh, light dome? Yeah, in your dome. Yes, yes. I um, bought the LED ones. I had fairy lights, and then I also recently bought the ones that have the, the strip on the back. And I'm going to put it, because I have to expand mine, and then I'm going to put them up on boards up underneath there. Okay. So that way it sticks there, and it runs off a USB instead of a battery. Yep. I did pretty much the same thing. I bought, actually, mine was called a computer cave, I think, uh, but it's a it's the coroplast thing with the essentially duct tape holding it together for hinges, and I put a uh, red LED light strip uh, in the top of it, and I run it off my 12-volt power bank. Nice. Mine's just PVC piping, so I can take it apart. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, back to the Sky Atlas 2000. Um, this is what this, the pages look like. Uh, one thing too, if you see on the left-hand one, this is way down at the southern uh, south celestial pole. There aren't any constellation lines on there. So what I did when I got this thing, I went and meticulously went in and drew all of the constellation lines in so I could find them. Because I don't know, when I look up in the sky, I can see those lines there, but I'm looking on a piece of paper and I can't find the doggone, you know, you know, I see the stars, but I can't see the shapes. So I had to actually go ahead and draw the constellation lines on mine. One caveat, I thought, well, red lights. Orange isn't red. Orange I'll be able to see. Nah, wrong. So I did like about 20 pages, maybe 15 or 20 pages in orange. I couldn't see them, and I had to erase them with alcohol and redo them in green. <laughs> Uh, I don't use this one much anymore because it's so big, but again, you know, if, if you had it under a, something to keep it away from, do it, it'd be a really good resource. Steve, Stephen Kaler said that he did the same exact thing. He drew constellation lines too. Yeah. Yeah. It's just hard to find them in, in that particular thing without the constellation lines. It's just kind of weird. You can see it in the sky, but you can't see it on paper. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, this one I would say is probably the default sky, the default atlas for just about everybody. The Sky and Telescope Pocket Sky Atlas. It's kind of Captain Kangaroo Pockets because it's, you know, six and a half by nine inches. So it's bigger than my pockets are, but still it's, it's a nice compact reference. And the nice thing is it not only has the, uh, the pictures, but it also has the constellation list at the beginning and what and what chart they're found on. Uh, you know, a thing of what are these Greek letters? Um, the chart legends, the charts themselves, and then in the back, an object index. So you can find all the named stars, the galaxies, star clusters, nebula by NGC, and all of that stuff. So, and they have a description and, you know, what magnitude they are. So unlike using the Mag 7 Star Atlas, uh, you've got all of the information in one in one place yeah for beginner um, for beginners and intermediate people this is the one i recommend that uh they get yeah i i tend to you know i kind of bounce back and forth, forth personally between my pocket sky atlas and my and that meg seven star atlas because again i kind of like the wider swath of the sky uh that the mag seven printed star you know the downloaded and printed star atlas is but you know generally this thing does a better job uh overall of of everything and you can see like i've taken put little index markers on it for where the descriptions are and where the i guess they don't i can't see them on this side but you know uh where the index are for the constellations how to find which page and so on 
Um, it's also available in the jumbo edition, which I made a smaller picture of, but that's a hardcover one uh, that's nine and a quarter by 12 inches tall. So I don't know why they still call it a pocket sky atlas, even though it's just a full size book, but nonetheless, it works pretty well. And all the pages are somewhat plasticized, so it stands up relatively well under due. Yeah, one of the nice things about the pocket sky atlas is if you travel, this is actually a good one to have because it covers the entire sky, obviously. It's a little bit smaller than the typical book. And like you said, it's somewhat laminated. It's not laminated, but it's better than paper. And <laughs> and uh, it's easy to read. Yeah, it's kind of got a plasticky paper. I think I saw it one time, uh, there was one of the smaller retailers out there, um, internet retailers. I think it might've been, I don't know, I've forgotten which one, but anyway, somebody had one that was supposedly more plasticized, but I haven't seen that for a long time. Yeah, I haven't had too many problems with mine. No, yeah, no, I haven't either. It, you know, the, it's getting kind of beat up around the edges. Uh, right, right. I just but, put it in my backpack and bring it along, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, that's the Sky and Telescope Pocket Sky Atlas. They're 25 bucks at the Sky and Telescope website, so easily uh, available. Uh, James Peasley mentioned something that I think is actually kind of cool. He he made a clear plastic copy of the, I think he means Telrad. He put tel, Tetrad, Telrad, and used that on the chart to help him find things. It kind of gives him a, a scale, I think. Yeah, I, I just I just put it in there. Uh, made a made a copy on a little piece of clear plastic so that then I can pull it out of a little pocket I made on the front of it and and move it around on the on the chart. That's a great idea. Find things easier. It's great. Yeah, idea. that's a that's a good point. Don't they have that Telrad? chart somewhere in the beginning of the book i think mm -hmm. so that you've got that for the reference as to what size it should be you can see it in your picture there uh in the upper right hand corner of the open page um on uh, right there it says page 12 um it's, it's right right there in in the screenshot that you've got you can see it just kind of peeking out from the oh, back oh uh, here on the, on the upper duh. left <laughs> duh <laughs> yeah i was looking on the page itself mm -hmm. yeah you're right i knew i saw it in there somewhere uh good point yeah and that does help definitely finding objects, uh, you know, because I use triangulation a lot. You know, I, you know, so many things in the sky you can represent by an asterism that's a triangle. And I'll go, you know, like, uh, you know, they're the, the three open clusters in, in a rig are down here in a line. They're about halfway between those two. So, you know, but it's really nice using the Telrad finder to find out exactly how far over from the stars you have to go. Oh. Um, one other resource that I like, uh, a few years ago, Jerry Jones, our observing chair, uh, brought this up. I don't remember if I bought this just and heard about it and bought it just before he brought it up or just after, but, um, you know, he just, he talked about this in a presentation a few years ago and it's called Objects in the Heavens. Now do not go to Amazon to buy this book because I went there to look to see if you know, how much it'd cost there, like a couple hundred bucks, and it's not worth a couple hundred books. But this is a nice little sp spiral bound book that uh, gives you, you know, all of the things that I see on the right hand side, the constellation list, the solar system info, bright objects. But the main thing is the main section of this book. And for every constellation, there's a, a page like this. And if you look on the left hand side, um, you know, it'll show you know, which are the brighter stars. If you want to see something that's, again, I've said about a half a dozen times already, I'm a, I'm the polar opposite of Claire, who is, you know, she's a dedicated uh, observer, probably getting close to being a master observer. I'm, I'm the guy that doesn't plan ahead and I'm going, ah, it's clear out. I think I'll go out tonight. Gee, what do I want to look at? I don't know. <laughs> so I'll take this book along with me. It's the same size as a pocket sky atlas. Um, and it's right next to it in, in my bin that has the books. And I'll, okay, I can see Auriga. I'll open it up, or in this case, I see Orion. I'll open it up to Orion and go, huh, okay, so what's good to see? Well, you go to the, uh, to the bolded ones like M42. Uh, it's got two exclamation points after it, and it's got a description, uh, you know, how large it is. And on the right-hand side, the, uh, the, the, uh, mag uh, you know, what the magnitude is. And, and on the right-hand side, it shows the picture of, uh, the diagram of where it is. So you can easily go, do I want to look at the brightest things that are out here, or do I want to dig down a little bit deeper? And, you know, it doesn't cover everything. Let me go back a page, because, so it has, uh, 
somewhere it says how many objects it goes to. But anyway, it goes, well, it goes down to magnitude 10. So it goes relatively deep, deep sky. But it's just a great little reference that, hey, I don't know exactly what I want to look for, but, you know, I can see this constellation. I'm going to go take a look at this. So uh, I, I just love this particular one. Here's a picture of, you know, since Perseus and Pegasus aren't quite as big or aren't quite as populated, I guess, as Orion, it they put Pegasus and Perseus together on the same page. And when there's when it's appropriate, they put... Uh, you know, a, a picture in there like this one of the double cluster, but the same sort of thing. You can see it's not just Messier objects, but it's NGC objects as well. Open clusters, emission nebula, the California nebula is shown there, uh, open clusters and so on. But you can see immediately if it's bolded, it's something you're going to be able to see with a small scope. So it's just a, a, a really nice little reference. Um, this is where you have to go to buy it or where you should go to buy it because it's the cheapest. Um, it's the author is Peter Beeren and uh, his site is BeerenDesigns.com. This is just a screenshot from the web page. Uh, so it's 25 bucks plus four dollars of shipping or you can get it in PDF uh, ebook form. Um, I have not ever bought that version. I've got the paper version. So I've got the 2495 version. But anyway, you can you can download that or uh, purchase that rather. And I see you can, I don't know if you can do that. Buy now looks like it like, looks like it could be uh, PayPal as well. But anyway, you can enter your uh, your credit card information on a secure web page. Hmm. Any anybody else here use that one or have heard of that one before? Hey Steve, what's this goals log sketchbook at the bottom there? Is that just us? Yeah, he has. Um, I didn't look at it too closely, but you can see he uh, there's a link on the left hand side for goals log sketchbook. So it's basically a book that you can, um, you know, an observing log book, and you can do your sketching, uh, do your planning in that book if you're again the physical paper type person. Cool. And it looks like you can buy both of them for $32.95. So you get a little bit of a discount uh, when you buy both of them together. And the same price for shipping instead of uh, $3.90 for each of them. But anyway, really good book. I, I highly recommend it. Um, another book. Uh, this one's probably a, almost a given that you've got to get it for a beginner. The Year-Round Messier Marathon. I've got this one. Uh, and actually what I did was I cheated for this, um, you know, the, the year round messy marathon, he's got more than just the charts. He's got, it's really a good starting out book, how to use a telescope. What are the different types of telescopes? You know, how, what's the view, you know, what gets inverted or what gets reversed when you're doing a refractor versus a Schmidt Cassegrain versus a, a reflector. Um, finder scopes, how to navigate the sky a little bit, all of that kind of stuff. So it has a lot of good information. It also has the um, Messier order in the spring and how many you can see at different times of the year and stuff like that. So there's a lot of good information in here. But the cool part about it is there's all these finder charts that are the, the Messier chart um, in the spring Messier marathon order from, I think they were in, the author is in California. So it's probably best from there. But it's relatively in the same order that we do the Messier Marathon up here in Minnesota. But it's nice that he has a sketch of what it would look like through the viewfinder and what it would look like through the telescope, as well as the finder charts and the description and everything. I actually took my book a long time ago and I love page protectors and, <laughs> and standalone copies. And I've got it, I've made the copy of that section of the book. Now, I suppose I shouldn't have said that on something that's gonna be posted on the internet, but what the heck. It's for personal use. I only did it once. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I've made made copies of those pages and uh, put them in a three ring binder and I can do the same thing, hold them up to the sky and look. And it, that's that was a really good resource. I haven't used it a lot recently because the other ones are, are pretty good. But uh, when I was starting out the first couple of years, it was a really cool resource for that. And again, uh, it's available at Sky and Telescope's uh, shop at sky.com site. Uh, again, I think that might be one that if you go to Amazon, it's going to be overpriced. So you want to go to Sky and Telescope. Don't we have one of those down at CGO too? 
Oh, good point. Thank you. I forgot about that. So mm -hmm. um, down at Cherry Grove, we have two on-site loaner scopes. Um, you know, we have the eight inch job and the 10 inch job in the warming house. And we set up, uh, you know, all of the stuff you need. So they're equipped with little flashlights. They're equipped with a planisphere. They're equipped with um, the mess the, the year round messy marathon book. So we've got two of those books down there in those plastic trays that go, that are in the corner on the Northeast corner of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the warming house. So you're right. Thank you. I forgot about that. So if you want to take a look at it, uh, go ahead down to Cherry Grove and do some ob observing and grab the book and take a look. Another really good a uh, book I bought when I was first starting out was Turn Left at Orion. And uh, this one's by Guy Consolmango, whatever his name is. Anyway, he is the uh, the guy that has the, Royal, the, uh, the Vatican Observatory. He's the astronomer for the Vatican Observatory. But he, you know, does this book. It's kind of designed for kids a little bit, but it's really a very, very good book. Uh, when I bought mine, it was a normal hardcover bound book. Now they're available in spiral bound, uh, depending on what you're doing, 30 or $35. You can also apparently now have a uh, all of the information or most of the information in the in the, a linked web pages at cambridge.org slash turn left. And uh, I, I found when I was poking around in it, it's a little bit cumbersome to move back and forth, you know, more fun to just flip the pages in the book. But again, like uh, the year-round Messier Marathon, it talks about how to get started in observing, you know, just sit down out there and start looking up and here's what I can see and how to see it. Mm -hmm. um, how to observe, you know, again, how the view varies in the finders and the reflectors and refractors and Schmidt cast screens. Uh, looking at the moon, solar objects, and so on, solar system objects, and so on. Here's a couple of pictures of uh, some of the observing pages. You know, the number of telescopes is how, uh, you know, how, how good of a view it is. Obviously, M42, it's five scopes. It's a five-star uh, object. Um, what are the sky, sky conditions? Any skies? Well, maybe not cloudy, but anything, <laughs> anything even urban. Um, you know, what kind of eyepiece you want to have low power or medium power, or you want, if you want to go for the trapezium itself, you can go, whoops, that's not the trapezium. Anyway, um, here's the trapezium. If you want, uh, you want to go high power, um, uh, what it's best seen through, you can see it through a binoculars and so on. So he has, you know, it in the sky, what the finder field of view is going to look like. Uh, what it's going to look like in the telescope, what it's going to look like at high power for looking at the tra trape trapezium, and then some descriptions. So he has similar things like that for all of the major objects out there. Um, uh, another one in Orion, uh, you know, Sigma Orionis, Orionis, whatever. <laughs> um, but taking a look at different views. So this one's a little bit, you know, it's only three stars so, or three uh, telescopes, not quite so good. You can't see that one as well in binoculars. It's a telescope object. So you get the idea of, of that. And as you can see, these are your screenshots from the act or actually they're scanner shots from the uh, book itself. Hmm. So um, anyway, there's obviously there's a lot of books out there, but these are a couple of really good books for for starting out and actually ending up using for quite a few years afterwards. This is excellent. Thanks, Steve. Let me just ask real quick uh, before you go on. Does anybody have any questions about any of these books or resources that Steve's mentioned? I don't see any new comments. Okay. All yours? Ah, uh, Nightwatch. I, no, I don't. Do you have any opinion on Nightwatch? Uh, I don't no. think I've used that one. Oh, Nightwatch, the book. Uh, I have it. I haven't really used it, but it is good. It really is a good book. I just, I just haven't brought it into my, my bag. It's, I keep it at home. Okay. Yeah, that one's a good resource to have at home. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it depends, Peter, on what you're looking for. If you want an atlas, I would get one of the ones that Stephen mentioned, either the uh, the Magnitude 7 Star Atlas or maybe the uh, Pocket Sky Atlas. Or Steve, what was the other one you mentioned? The, uh, the triatlas. I, I wouldn't use the triatlas for starting well, out. Objects in the heavens, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Objects in the heavens. That one, again, lazy astronomer, that one's good. 
Yeah, Don mentions that he likes Nightwatch. It's a good beginner book with some decent starts, decent charts for getting started. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyway, let's move on a little bit. So um, the other navigation aid is planospheres. And, you know, if you're out there every night and you're, you know, again, dedicated like uh, Trina or Claire are, or you are, Shresh, you probably don't need it. But, uh, you know, if I go out once and then I, you know, it's two months before I go out the next time, I've got to orient myself to the sky again. So that's where I think a planisphere comes in handy is, okay, just generally, where am I? You know, what what is this I haven't seen for two months here? So, uh, you know, that's that's what I like planospheres for. And I always carry a planisphere with me of one form or another. So the different types of planospheres, of course, there are ones that uh, that are just specific to the month. So skymaps.com, really cool little resource. It's published monthly. It's a free download of a PDF. And it, uh, tell you what, I'll zoom in on the next one here. So this is the current one for, for January. And the nice thing about it is it's designed for, you know, what the sky looks like, uh, you know, eight o'clock in this part of January, you know, maybe, uh, 7 p.m. late January, but it goes through here are the main objects out there. And the nice thing about this kind of thing is it's custom to this particular month. So normal planospheres, you know, they're designed to be used for years. They're not going to show where the planets are since they move. They're not going to show where uh, comets are because they disappear. But here you can see Mars is approximately, there's my cursor, Mars is approximately here uh, near Zenith. Uh, at this point in time, Jupiter is over here. And also, um, you know, in the upper part here, going through Draco and going through Ursa Minor, uh, there's a comet. And uh, honestly, I didn't notice that one, didn't know about this comet before. I just learned this one. So um, that little streak up there, that's comet C2022E3, try that again, comet C2022E3ZTF. Um, it was yeah. discovered at Palomar on March 2nd, 2022, hence the C-2022, using the Zwicky Transit Facility. Uh, that's why the ZTF in it. And uh, that comet's going to be passing within 28 million miles of Earth on February 1st, 2023. And the peak brightness is estimated to be magnitude 5 uh, on February 1st. So mm -hmm. um, this one's coming up as an object we'll be able to see coming up later this month. Um, it's going to be kind of a dim naked eye object, better a telescopic object. Um, this one, it, this is the one and done because it's got an orbital period of about 50,000 years. So we'll never see that one again. Hey, Steve, uh, these maps, uh, they typically have it set for a particular latitude. Where is it? I don't see it, where the latitude on the, oh, latitude 40, I see it on the, on the right side there. Yeah, he does have he does have this for the northern hemisphere. He has one for the southern hemisphere, which I've never used. But it's generally uh, it's designed for around uh, latitude uh, forty degrees, so it's pretty good for us. Yara also mentions a guide to sky watching by David Levy uh, as a as a good book as a good reference book with charts. Okay, again, I don't think that's one I've used, but I've heard of that one before too. Uh, Michael Cowper explains about planispheres that they show most easily how the sky changes through the year uh, for mm -hmm. beginners to understand zenith stars, hor horizon skimming stars, and when a desired constellation will be highest and easiest, you can use a planisphere. Yep, very good point. Yeah, the other part, just finishing up on skymaps.com, uh, one thing that's nice about them, too, is, you know, they've got this glossary on the, on the side, but mainly, um, you know, if I don't have my telescope with, I just want to look up, what can I see with my naked eye? Well, basically, that's the brighter uh, stars. Or what can I see if I've got a pair of binoculars with me? So here's what I can see tonight with the binoculars, and what do I need to have a telescope? So, um, you know, it's just a good monthly reference. And, I've, you know, quite often when I go out for public nights out at Eagle Lake, I'll print off 10 or 20 of them and give them out to some of the visitors there. Another one that's similar to this is Abrams Planetarium Sky Calendar. Trina actually just made me aware of this thing this morning uh, in an email. So I grabbed these two shots from the email that she sent me. Um, Trina, would you want to talk about this one a little bit more? Yeah, it's it's similar to your um, to the to the the sky maps, um, but I like this one because it just comes to you, in, and you get like November, December, and January in a in that particular um, 
package from the mail and it comes to you every every three months so okay. next month i'll get february march and april sometime here in january and for that um and it's it's for central it's for our latitude because it comes out of michigan okay. and so it's it's fairly fairly close and it's only twelve dollars a year um, okay. and one thing i think that varies between this and the uh, sky maps that i just showed was mm -hmm. this is that uh these are the samples that they have on their web page so looking at the sky calendar so it's showing a view on the back side of it it's showing a view of what it looks like from the horizon it's not just a a, a planisphere view right so that way if you're a little, you're a little, little bit of a beginner and you're not sure exactly how far up to look to where you're looking this is what i've used and i've, I've kept it going <laughs> over the last few years just like okay where do i orient myself how, how far do i look up you know where is it going to be close to some other object like the moon um you know so i know which direction i'm going to look at hey, hey trina would you mind mentioning this at a meeting maybe or putting it on the forum so others sure. can see this yeah this i can definitely great. do that this is great mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Stephen Kohler mentioned something that I was going to mention later, but uh, two more um, guides, the Interstellarium Deep Sky Atlas, as well as the Uranometria 2000. Uh, I also use both of these, and these are tremendous um, uh, resources for uh, as sky charts and things like this. They are a little bit more advanced, they're not beginner level. I would call these advanced level, but the Interstellarium Deep Sky Atlas and obviously the Uranometria 2000 that's been around for a while are two also mm -hmm. two very good references yeah yeah the, the paper ones here are a little bit easier to carry if you're not sure how much you're much how much to bring when you're going out that night and he also mentions the night sky observer's guide i've not used that one i'm not sure what the source of that is has anybody else used the night sky observer's guide mm, i have not i think i've heard of it before but i have not used it myself mm, i've not heard of that one trina have you heard of that Anybody? Well, the only one that I know that's somewhat similar to that night sky is the one from John Popoli. And that's the little book that he wrote. Oh, is that what he's talking about? The Popoli book? Poss possibly. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah that one will tell you by season which one to, which where to go out and where to look and little tidbits and stuff like that. Yeah. Hey, Steve, so, Steven, is this by John Popoli, the one you're mentioning? Because John's a member of our club. <laughs> yeah, I know John. No, no, this is uh, Sander and Keppel, the Night Sky Observer's Guide. It's Night Sky Observer's Guide is really great for scopes of, say, 16 inch and, and larger, yeah, yeah. but it, it covers everything. Yeah, Don mentions that it asks, is this the big multi book series? Yeah, think... it's it's two two observing guides plus a, a data book. Um, which kind of like find that kind useful. of like the Uraniumetria, where they have that guide and they have the two northern yeah. and southern hemisphere. Oh, actually, the guide may be the Uraniumetria one I'm thinking of. Yeah, that has that comes with a guide. Yeah, so two two books divided into uh, summer, the two two divided by season, not by northern and southern hemisphere. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Very cool. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, let me continue on here. So some other planispheres. So if you're not inclined to purchase one, you can always uh, download a, uh, Uncle Al Star Wheel, and there are quite a few others as well. But this one's a free PDF uh, download. It's you know, print out the two sheets and get busy with the scissors and uh, take the envelope part and fold it up and then uh, take the disc part and cut it into a round disc. Um, obviously, uh, you know you put it on fairly heavy paper it's going to be susceptible to do but it was free so it doesn't cost anything and it actually works pretty well uh you know i mentioned the bottom uh bullet point there no pivot so it can be difficult to rotate but what i do is i just you know hold it with my right hand and take my left hand and where it says february just kind of pull it down there and you know you pull it down into the envelope and if you've cut it fairly fairly well into a circle uh it spins pretty decently um, but the nice thing about it is you know it's just on paper or cardboard so if you want to add some specific objects you want to view uh you can do that pretty easily okay. if you're if you're not cheap and you want to buy a planisphere the one i like best the one that i use it's always in my bag is david chandler's the night sky planisphere now this is two-sided if you look at the left hand picture there it's showing uh 
you know, the, the pivot, of course, is the North Celestial Pole. And so south is up at the top of that, but it gets really distorted down at the edges of it. So you flip it over and that's showing the, uh, the southern horizon. So you get a really distorted version, you know, at, when you're holding it upside down to look towards south, or you hold it right side up, uh, if you will, and, you know, with the horizon down, and you can see that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the front and back covers of it are clear plastic with the printing on it, and the the middle uh, disc is a kind of a plasticized cardboard. Uh, so, you know, the serrated edge can kind of wear a little bit, but it's, uh, but it lasts forever. I think I'm still on my very first one that I've bought in probably 2004, 2005, something like that. Um, another one, uh, Sky and Telescope. I did buy this one a few years back, quite a few years back now. But one thing about this one, it's, it's a nice star wheel, a nice planisphere. But the thing is, Yes, we did feel this clueless and overwhelmed. Absolutely, I did. I still do. I'm a perennial beginner. <laughs> um, anyway, this, the star wheel. Uh, this one, it's they've plasticized the outside, the green parts of it. But on the inside those of the envelope part of it, it's just plain cardboard. And I found this thing dewed up and it kind of get got cr crunched up and folded up. So, mm. <laughs> you know, it works, but I ended up throwing this one away. One that I just ran across while I was researching for this thing. This is this is huge. This is 18 inches in diameter. There are some other ones that are pretty big. Uh, the David Levy one that I think somebody mentioned in chat is a huge one too. It's a big yellow one. But this one looks kind of interesting. Uh, I just found it, I believe, on Amazon. It's 30 bucks, so it's not cheap by a long shot. Uh, and it's huge, 18 inch diameter, so it's kind of hard to carry around and stuff. But it has all of the Messier objects on it, as well as some of these special views of uh, some of the specific specific ones. It looks like M17, uh, so M65, so it looks like parts of the uh, uh, parts of the, the uh, Virgo cluster of galaxies in there. Hmm. Um, so anyway, so that's all the paper ones. I've just run out of paper stuff here. So uh, some other ways you can uh, help in navigating, of course, uh, the telescopes themselves. Now, anybody, anybody that's listened to me talk on a couple of things, you're going to get tired of me saying this one again, but uh, Celestron came out with these StarSense Explorer inexpensive lines of telescopes a couple of years back, and this thing just works. Um, don't buy the cheapest ones of the scopes, but if you've, you know, they just um, started out with a couple of small refractors and uh, a couple of small reflectors, but then they recently added, I think this year they added an eight and a 10 inch job to the mix. And also time the five inch to the mix. And uh, this is when you basically use an app on your smartphone and put it in a bracket and it becomes the finder for the scope. And I actually went against my own advice and I bought the cheapest one, that's the small 80 millimeter refractor on the floppiest mount that you can possibly get because all I wanted was the app because it is a licensed app. You can download it for free, but to unlock it, to use it, you have to buy a scope. <laughs> and so I bought the scope just to get this bracket. And then I made up this bracket to fit on my, uh, my DAB. And uh, it works out really well. So it's not supported, quote unquote, but it works fine. Um, there's a couple of screenshots from opening it up. If you've already had it set up, uh, you turn it, you open up the app and it says, are you still aligned? And if you are, you just go ahead and keep on going or you need alignment and then it walks through uh, the alignment process. Because basically, next picture, uh, the alignment process, you take a, uh, you have it in the bracket, you center the camera underneath the mirror. Because uh, let me back up. Okay. There's a mirror in here. And so the camera is looking down in the, you know, from the mirror, it's looking up into the sky. Turns. And uh, anyway, go back to that. So anyway, you'll see an image on here. And at dusk, when you can still see stuff with a camera, you just basically line up the cursor on, you know, say the top of a pine tree or something, uh, center the scope field of view on the top of the pine tree, and then center that cursor on the top of the pine tree, and it's lined up. So you've aligned your, your, uh, your finder that way and then you know then you go into the view mode and you as you move it around the uh 
telephone is using its internal gyroscope and its internal compass to change the view so it matches just like any planetarium program. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can see where it's at. Uh, and then let me go to, you can click on what objects you want to look at and it'll, it'll have a little series of orange arrows pointing, hey, it's off way up to the right and you move the scope and it gets closer. You get on it and then you stop moving for a little bit. And it says, okay, tell us, you know, uh, don't move the scope, I'm finding the object. And then it, about two seconds later, it takes a, uh, mm -hmm. it takes an image of the, of the object, of the sky at that point. And then it does plate solving and figure out how close mm -hmm. to the object it is. So the, uh, the image on the screen will snap a little bit, but then you can move it up and fine tune it and you look through and it's there. So anyway, it's a really cool little thing for, um, for, uh, general uh, general observing. Now these are screenshots when I first got it uh, of the of the stuff, and it only had the Messier objects, the Caldwell objects, uh, double stars, and bright stuff. More recently, they've added to it more deep sky objects, and that includes the NGC mm -hmm. catalog and IC catalog and some specialized uh, galaxies. And the nice part about it is, just like any other uh, cell phone based uh, planetarium app, it only has the you know it can like the list of messier objects here it'll list all of them but it can kind of tell messier one messier two are brighter messier three four five they're dimmer because they're not up available in the sky at this point in time so you know you don't have to waste time looking at stuff that's not there or trying to trying to look for stuff that's not there hey, so anyway pretty good uh, little app mm -hmm. couple things hey edna could you mute your uh, computer i think we could hear you when you're speaking and then um michael Kaufler, i think has a, a star sense michael did you want to say anything about star sense i don't know if michael's on mute or not anyway i know he had mentioned early on like in the beginning of your presentation that he has yeah. one of these. can you hear me i didn't have my microphone on yeah michael go ahead uh i bought a star sense for someone for a graduation gift i bought the um the Newtonian it's about a five inch Newtonian and we took it to Kenwood Park um so it's it's the largest one that they had before they came out with the big Dobbs and this was a high school graduate and she downloaded the app and about three minutes later we were looking at all the objects in the sky and it had a list of easy things and list of hard things and it was just incredible it it made every other experience i've had with a computerized telescope ridiculous it was i mean this teenager had she went down the easy list we were in the city at kenwood park and she went down the easy list in in 10 minutes and every object was perfectly centered and if we needed to go move this telescope because there was a tree in the way we would just move it and one minute later, it would be working again all by itself. Uh, it, it make I think it makes every other thing for the casual observer and for beginners that this could eliminate that problem of beginners buying a computerized telescope and then sticking it in the basement forever. <laughs> That's great. I agree with you a hundred percent, Michael. Um, yeah. I also, uh, I've got a C5, a five inch Celestron Schmidt cast screen, which is equivalent to the one on the right hand side and the bottom on this picture. And I'm kludged up my own bracket because it's a C5 and I have an Altaz mount. So I don't have the star sense version of it, but I kludged up a bracket on my C5 and, uh, and have it mounted to it. And it's the same thing, you know, I can, uh, you know, I can barely see the stars, you know, it's, it's not quite dark enough that I could do star hopping, but you know, I've got this thing lined up and I select an object and points it to it and it's in the eyepiece. And also, like you said, you can, you can easily pick, if, you know, if you're doing it in your backyard and you've got trees and blocking mm -hmm. certain parts of the sky, you can pick it up, move it to another spot because you're not doing a two star alignment like a normal telescope. You can pick it up. All it is, is it's a finder. So you can pick it up and move it and it's still still there. So it's really a cool app. Um, and Sharesh, you said that 
you can also do this. Can you do the same thing to, with Sky Safari Pro, basically? Yeah, you can, as long as it's a mount that's compatible, which means it has to have an ASCOM driver or Indy, um, okay. you, can, you can control a telescope with, with Sky Safari. I think somebody's still speaking. Can you guys mute uh, your computers if you're not speaking, please? Thank you. And then uh, Stephen asked, are there any other systems besides StarSense that can uh, do this kind of thing? I'm not, well, you do plate solving for imaging, but I don't know of any others that do plate solving for this. And that's one thing I'm wondering, Sky Safari Pro, does it do plate solving too, or is it just using the accelerometers and the... and the? It doesn't plate solve, but I will tell you when I've used it, it is precise. Oh. Uh, it work, Once you align it, uh, it works really well. There is um, another, I'm trying to remember what it was. I know I've controlled my, my scope with Stellarium. But not the not the phone app. I actually had a, a laptop with me. Okay. You, you can control a computer uh, telescope using uh, Stellarium as well. But there's another one too. I just can't remember the name of it. Uh, yeah, with with Sky Safari though, it has to recognize the telescope equipment. Yeah, to the, do that. It has to be, the mount. Yeah, it has to be compatible. Yeah, if, compatible. You, if you don't, but then most it work. But most modern, especially beginner mounts, beginner level mounts, it definitely connects. Uh, what's that other Celestron product? Uh, uh, Sky Sky Sync. Uh, there's also a Celestron Sky Sync that also will control your telescope. Um, That's true. Yeah, it puts out a Wi-Fi signal that you can pick up on your phone. Okay, and and you can use that as well. Yeah, and also uh, you mentioned that there's also Celestron has something called Star Sense without the Explorer on it, and that's a camera that you can uh, attach to like a C8 or, you know, or something or on an AVX mount or something like that, mm -hmm. AVX or a C5 mount. Uh, but that one, it's a dedicated system. It's not using a smartphone, and I don't know how well it operates. I've heard people say that it works good, but uh, I haven't personally used that. But I have personally used this, not on a StarSense scope, because I, you know, Frankensteined it, but it works great. Um, someone asked, or, oh, Phil asked earlier, are there any caveats? Yeah, the only caveat I've had is... Uh, if it's a full moon or if it's pretty bright moon, if you're within yeah, 30 degrees of the moon, it won't find it because uh, it just gets washed out because it is doing a plate solve to be able to find the moon. So if it's too early in the evening that you can't see the stars at all, uh, or if it's uh, so light polluted, like, you know, if you're sitting outside the Southdale library where you can only see about six stars, probably doesn't work in that. But under moderate, moderate light pollution, it does work. <laughs> Jacob, can you um, mute your machine, please? Go ahead, Steve. Okay. Anyway, so that's enough on that one. Um, but again, it you know, th since they added the uh, more deep sky objects to give you the NGC catalog, I, you know, I like it more than I did at first because it really was a beginner type of thing at first. Uh, but now it's opened up the catalogs to more objects. So it's pretty cool. Um, going on to the uh, more conventional type ones, so if you worked with any of our large scopes, the Padre out at Eagle Lake or the BAD, the big aperture Dobsonian, the Star Master down at Cherry Grove, or either of the obsessions up at uh, Eagle Lake, you've seen what digital setting circles are. Uh, those aren't this particular brand. This is a newer one uh, called a, a Nexus, but these you have to have... Uh, you have to have encoders on the scope. Um, so you can see it can work with little refractors or it can work with big dobs, but this one's a fairly new one. It's uh, probably 300 bucks, but then you also have encoders, which are like another 150 bucks. So it's a little more advanced thing, but it, you know, adaptable to a lot of scopes. Um, this is the one that's that we have on all of our scopes. I think we're actually Don Gaz to gear here. So I, I think, um, I think uh, uh, up at up at Long Lake, one of them is being replaced with with this thing because I think you had a problem with one of the Argo Navises and you're replacing it with a Nexus. But anyway, this is what we normally have had on all of our scopes, and you can see this is what the encoders are. So it's a dedicated type system, and you can either use it as a push to, or you can use it as a uh, as a uh, with servos to make it a full go to system. But uh, nonetheless, this is kind of the conventional way of doing it. And then finally, uh, computerized go-to scopes. 
I have a love hate relationship with some of them. You know, if you take a look at some of them that we have, like the C6, uh, Nexstar C6 um, in our loaner scope uh, group, you know, the um, you've got kind of a dual learning curve. You've got to learn how to use the electronics at the same time you're learning the sky. So, you know, I've always been one of, for a first scope, get a DOB or get a, you know, some kind of a non-computerized scope. That kind of changed with the introduction of those, those star, uh, star sense explorers. But, but generally, you know, this, this has been the, the main thing for automatically knowing the sky. Um, and it depends on how well you've done your two-star alignment as to how good of an accuracy it does. And uh, I guess the main thing with the lower cost scopes like this that I don't like is you can't just push them around like you can push a daub around. You've got to use the, the buttons on the hand pad or use the PC app if you're using a PC app uh, to move the scope around. But nonetheless, this is uh, one way to make it around the sky. And that is about all I have there. So. Um, any other any other comments or stuff that you guys want to talk about? This is fantastic. Steve. The only one that I know of that that will have the you can do the, the go to with and you can disengage the clutches and it will still recognize where it is, is my Orion Star Seeker 4. Because I can push it around and it will keep going. It's the only cool. one that I found that does that. So cool. I wasn't aware of that. So push two dobs also can do that. So like I have the Orion um uh, IntelliQuest 12 DOB, and that's a push to, which means that you it'll give you the coordinates on two scales, but you have to physically push the scope yeah. around until right. it, it matches up. That will also obviously work. Um, you can move that around. Right, um, but my little my little six inch at least I can re-engage it, and it'll still be a go-to scope if I wanted it to be. Oh, okay, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th and that's the difference. You know, uh, yeah, uh, that one I wasn't aware of, Trina, but like mm -hmm. you're seeing. Shresh, there's a difference between a go to, a lower cost go to scope and a push to scope where you can have just the digital setting circles without the servos. You can easily push it around. That's one thing that just to finish up and kind of an advertisement for some of our big scopes. You know, again, all of our large truss stops that we have in the club, they have the servo cat and they have the Argo Navis. Uh, digital setting circle well with that kind of a system you can disengage the clutch and because it has separate encoders uh that are always watching where the scope is pointing you can disengage the clutch you can move it around you can re-engage the clutch you can do a go-to again it'll find out where it's at again so those uh you know those work really well because you can use them as a fully manual scope you can use them as a push to just using the digital setting circle. You can use them as a full go to, or you can disengage it, poke around the sky a little bit and re-engage it and away you go. So, you know, that's other than the fact that you've got a lot of moving pieces in it, that's one of the best systems out there. And with that, I, I appreciate everybody uh, hanging in here for this long. It was going, I guess we talked through a little, I, then I finish a little sooner, but uh, anyway, we had some pretty good discussion in here. Steve, you covered a lot of ground. Uh, thank you for doing this. Hey, does anybody have any other questions, anything else you wanted to discuss on these subjects? Either star maps, phone apps, telescopes, push to, go to. <laughs> All that stuff. Um oh. Yeah, the, the Jackson Middle School, you are correct that Ron Schmidt runs that program. He's the resident astronomer up there. The one thing I'll plug for our club is if you're interested in these types of telescopes, our loaner scope fleet pretty much has every type of scope that Steve has mentioned, whether it be the go-to. I think we even have a push-to, don't we? One, one of the dobs, I thought. Um, but we definitely have go-to telescopes as well as the various types of telescopes, refractors, reflectors, Schmidt cast grains, et cetera. Uh, if you're interested in trying out a scope before you were to purchase one, for example. Yeah. Yep. And I would only add for the beginners, don't get too overwhelmed with it. Just try one, see how it goes, see if you like it. If not, you can always switch to the next one. That's why we have so many books. How how, how many telescopes do we have in the lower scope fleet now? Like I, six, 16, I think. 16 or 19, something like that. Not 19 yet, 16 or 17. Okay, 16 or 17 scopes are available to members to, to check out, just like 
checking out a library book. Well, I, I don't see any other questions. I see a lot of thank yous to Steve. Okay, well, thanks okay, everyone great. for attending. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, the next uh, beginner group presentation will be on February 11th, which is also a Saturday at one o'clock. Dave Faulkner will be discussing discussing his trip to his recent trip to Chile. Uh, Dave is one of our club's NASA ambassadors, and he got invited on a tour of these professional observatories in Chile, and he's going to do a presentation for us on February 11th. So I hope to see everybody online again uh, at then. In the meantime, uh, if you have any questions about the club or the BSIG program, feel free to reach out to me or to any of the other uh, people that have spoke. Trina is the club president now, so you can ask her questions as well. Um, or even direct them to Steve if you have any questions about this presentation. Anyway, thank you all. Appreciate it, Steve. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. So we'll see you later. All right, take care, guys. Bye.